it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you all for, for making the time that we can share together today. Um, I'd like to start just by acknowledging I'm speaking in English, which is my mother tongue, and I know that for many of you that's not the case, so I'd like to acknowledge that that additional effort uh, for anyone else who's speaking, and also that, you know, we're meeting visually, but we also are virtually we also, of course, have bodies that have our own needs and space and time and to recognize recognize that as well. But I just wanted to say hi to everyone and that, yes, as Yanis said, I am the data analysis and research lead at Donut Economics Action Lab, as well as a visiting research fellow. And I'd like to present a little bit about the concepts of donut economics and some ideas around how it's being put into practice uh, worldwide. So I have prepared some slides to do that, which should, it's always the moment of truth with Zoom. Can you see my screen? Yeah, great. Okay, so as I mentioned, I just prepared a few slides. So well, quite a few, probably too many, actually. Um, I just wanted to ground us in a little bit of where I'm coming from before we start diving into the concepts. So I was doing a master's in development economics at Dalhousie University, the city where I was born, which is in Halifax, Canada. And uh, I discovered the field of ecological economics almost by accident, actually completely by accident. I was looking to do a course in environmental economics as part of my, my master's study. But actually, my department wasn't even offering a course at the graduate level in environmental economics at that time. And so I started looking around and I found a course called Economics for Resources and Environmental Management in the School for Management. And it's like what I'm looking for. So I, I wrote the prop and said, hey, can I join? And they said, sure. And so I did. And it was a decision that changed the course of my life because it turned out to be a course in ecological economics, which is sounds very similar to environmental economics. But there's a big difference, which largely has to do with how it recognizes the scale of the economy within our finite planet. And that was a huge difference that I'll talk more about throughout this talk. But it, it blew my mind. And I just almost in the matrix, I took the red pill and just started reading and asking questions and reading more and asking more questions. And it eventually took me on a path of deep into ecological economics, which is where I discovered the you know donut economics and this ideas around it. And but really the idea of ecological economics for me it was a paradigm shift. And I use that term in the sense of of what the philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn refers to it, where he thinks of a paradigm shift as almost the end result of crises in academic disciplines. And his whole thesis is that essentially things don't change in science so much incrementally. Rather, there are revolutions and abrupt changes in, in disciplinary thinking and in ideas. So we can think of of Ptolemy and Copernicus, or Newton and, and Einstein. And I would argue that right now we're going through a similar, a similar process within the discipline of economics. And the way that Kuhn actually uh, described, one of the ways that he described that process of anomalies uh, or of, of crises in scientific disciplines is with this image here, where essentially it's a way of showing that the same the same information can be presented in such a way that it's perceived depending on, on what a person sees, but also what they have been taught to see. Uh, how that, well, that that can have an influence on their, on, on their thinking. And this image, for example, it's, it's an illusion that can be seen as either a duck or a rabbit. Like, which one do you guys see? Do you see more duck, more rabbit? Um, well, Kuhn's point is essentially that it, oh, I would need to see the chat. Well, I'll look at the chats later, but if, feel free to see what you see more, uh, more of first. But Kuhn's point, of course, is that it's neither a duck nor a rabbit, of course. It's, a, it's lines on a page, or in this case, dots on the screen. And the way that we perceive that information has an influence on, on, what, we, on what we perceive it to be. And for me, there it came a profound moment, one of my my just huge mentors goes by the name of Herman Daly. 
And this is a textbook that he co-wrote with uh, Josh Farley. It's the only textbook that I have re ever read from cover to cover. And Herman Daly is a prolific writer, uh, just a visionary, as well as a very humble human being. And I was very saddened to learn that, that he passed away about three weeks ago. So we've lost a giant, but his, his ideas, I'm so convinced are, are alive and well. And one of the big things that he, that he presented when talking about the paradigm shift that's needed in economics was these two images. So the top image is pretty much one of the fun foundational images in economics. It's the circular flow diagram, which says that we have households, we have firms, and households exchange their labor to firms, and in return, they receive wages. And as well in the more in the more complicated versions, we also have government, we have investments, we have financial institutions, and we also trade with the rest of the world. This is essentially the basis of our national our system of national accounts. And it's been very, very useful in terms of understanding production, consumption, income, expenditure, all of that stuff. But the core critique of ecological economics is that it's missing something very, very important, which is the sense that there's nothing, there's nothing contained. It's not contained within anything. And so this is where almost the, the goal of economic growth, which is the primary, uh, primary macroeconomic goal of virtually all governments in the world, that goal, it isn't necessarily questioned by any means in this upper model that you can see there because there's no problem with growth forever because the economy is not a part of anything else it's a whole so it can just keep growing into that blank white space and what Herman Daly recognized of course is that the economy is not the whole the economy is part of our finite planet and we are fully dependent on on our planet and the earth system for all of the materials and resources and energy that are used to, to power that circular flow, as well as we're completely dependent on that earth system for the assimilation of all the wastes that we produce. So essentially what Herman did was he drew a box around the economy. And that is just, to me, it's just a wonderful example of how a vision or a paradigm can be changed. Because for me, I studying, economics had never thought that that was even an issue. But once I saw it, I said, of course, of course, the economy is not the whole, it's part of a much broader and bigger whole. So this is another classic example from Herman Daly in ecological economics, it's the embedded economy. And the whole argument is that essentially we can, in the 20th century, the 19th century, the 18th century, we could afford to think that the economy could keep growing because it was so small relative to the, the ecosystem, the earth system within which we are embedded. But of course, nothing can grow forever in a finite space. And eventually we hit a point where we start bound, you know, bumping up against ecosystem limits. And Herman and other ecological economists, including myself, argue that we have very much reached that point and that we are starting to see the impacts of bumping up against ecosystem limits in the form of climate breakdown, in the form of biodiversity loss, and many other uh, ecological crises that we that we see. And one of the another image very much influenced, you can tell by that by that full world type of vision was created by my colleague Kate Rayworth. And you can see here that she's taking the same idea that the economy is embedded within the earth system. We're totally dependent on it for materials and the assimilation of waste and energy. But, but she opened up the box of the economy a little bit. She said, okay, what is the economy? It's not just a box. It's actually, it's embedded within society. And society, you know, the, the economy is a social construct. So of course we can show up in the market, as we're typically thought, as we typically analyze economic transactions is through market type. The one vision that you see in most economics classes, of course, supply and demand, uh, and that equilibrium between supply, supply and demand through markets. But there's much more than that, of course. We have our relationship uh, with respect to the state. Uh, and we also, she brought in these other two on the vertical axis, these two realms of provisioning 
that are often go visible in in lots of the the analyses that pre predominantly took place in the 20th century right we had free marketeers versus socialists or communists so you have the market versus the state but what often get ignored that kate wanted to put focus on is of course the role of the households the care economy that we all wake up literally in this place every day as well as the role of the commons uh, the volunteer the co-creating space of 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 interaction where not necessarily any money changes hands. So this vision of the embedded economy to me is very much, you know, needs to transform into the starting point of, of how we view the economy and our relationships within it. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of urgency in adopting a new economic vision that takes into account you know, our role within the broader social and ecological system. Because, I mean, just to take a step back, my entire adult life has taken place in the 21st century. And that 22 years that we're at now has been marked by just recurring crises and shock. So we had the financial meltdown in 2008, which of course triggered a decade of austerity. We're in this era of climate and ecological breakdown with with you know stronger storms and droughts and wildfires and all of the you know millions of people displaced through those those more extreme events we have a growing awareness of both of those for example the financial meltdown and the climate breakdown uh in terms of global movements of people standing up and recognizing the core issues through the occupy movement uh, or through los indignados in spain for the financial austerity crises as well as, of course, many of you will know Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, and those who are standing up, recognizing the core drivers of the climate and ecological breakdown. But what we're also seeing is a rise in, in the level of, of crackdowns, of repression, of protest and civil and dissidents worldwide. And of course, we're also, you know, we're three, almost three years into the COVID lockdown, this pandemic that has generated just massive social and economic impact. So I, my point here is to illustrate that we are, through all of these crises, we are you know, profoundly connected with one another as well as with the rest of the living world, while at the same time acknowledging that the impacts of these crises are getting you know, there are disproportionate impacts based on wealth, on race, on age, on gender, on whether you're in the global north or the global south. And really what, what the crises illustrate is that they have been essentially driven by the very systems that we have invented. And that for many, it's not just a, uh, you know, a, an issue of, of human well-being or a lowering of of living standards, but for many, it's actually a, an existential risk. And so we argue that, of course, we need to fundamentally transform the very systems that we have depended upon. And this is where we offer a vision. It's a vision, not the only one, uh, in the form of a donut. So we think of it as a compass for the 21st century, where the goal of of the whole model is that we want to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. So we want to make sure nobody is falling in, in the hole of the donut, which means that they're falling short on the essentials of life, like food, water, health, uh, gender equality, housing, political voice, and many more. And these have been uh, derived from the social priorities of the Sustainable Development Goals. So they've essentially been agreed upon by the world's governments. So get everyone above the social foundation and into that green space of the donut. But simultaneously, of course, we don't want to overshoot the ecological ceiling because that means that we, our level of resource use is placing too much pressure on this delicate and finely balanced planet that we call home. We start causing climate climate change. We, we acidify the oceans. We you know, destroy ecosystems and the critical biodiversity that they house. And these indicators, the nine planetary boundaries that you can see there, are, are essentially the, 
what our best available science says at the moment maintains the stability of the Earth system. So if we can live within that green space of the donut, the safe and just space for humanity, then I'm, I'm convinced that we can actually, for the long term, live with well-being and resilience and with enough for all within the means of the living planet. The problem, of course, is that if that's the goal, then right now we are very, very far from achieving it. So right now, billions of people are falling short on their most essential needs. And they live in communities and cities and nations, both rich and poor. While simultaneously, we're overshooting multiple planetary boundaries on climate change, on fertilizer use, land system change and biodiversity loss, as well as since this image was created, additional planetary boundaries have been quantified and found to be in overshoot as well around chemical pollution, as well as uh, green water boundary. So what this image says to me is that we have a lot of work to do. We need to transform. We need an economic system that's capable of bringing us within the donut from both sides at the same time. And that is not the system that we have inherited. It, was, it wasn't designed to face that. And that gives a huge you know, need to redesign our economic system. We need new policies, new theories, new models, and new just ways of interacting in an economic realm, understanding the economic as much broader than just the markets. But this is a global vision, the donut, and it works very clearly. Meet the needs of all people on the planet within the means of the living planet, of course. But a lot of my work has been saying, okay, but how can we apply that? Or how can we adapt that model? And think about it at different scales, at lower scales, where much policymaking takes place, like at the cities or at national level. And I was part of a study that we led looking at nearly 150 countries. And here's just four across the range. And let me start with Malawi. So we can see that Malawi is has a level of economic activity of less than $2,000 per person per year. And that is clearly, well, they're clearly falling far short in terms of meeting the social foundation. There's a lot of red in the middle of that, of that donut. But, but at the same time, people in Malawi are well within their fair share of planetary boundaries, or at least across all of the ecological indicators that we looked at. Then you have China, partly falling short, partly in overshoot, similar to the global picture. So they need to, they're facing that same double whammy of getting back within, while at the same time meeting the needs of their residents for the first time. Then we have Spain, you know, doing better in terms of social performance, at least based on this on this uh, international standard, but overshooting their their fair share of planetary boundaries even more. And then we have Canada, this the country where I was born, where you can see is again doing relatively well, at least on international terms from a social perspective, achieving nearly all of the social thresholds that we define, but just massively, massively overshooting their level of pressure on the planet. Now here is nearly, how many are there? That's more than a hundred nations. And what you can see here is Malawi and China and Canada is, this is plotted in relation to the number of boundaries that their each country is transgressing versus the number of social thresholds they've achieved. So we want to be in that upper left corner where the donut is. And what this image shows is it's almost like it's almost like a magnet pushing us away. There's no nation that can put up its hand and say, you know, I'm I'm living in the donut, uh, that all nations have a lot of work to do in terms of getting there. But of course, the pathways in towards the donut are different depending on where you're coming from. So the lowest income, the poorest nations in the world, what would that pathway look like for them to reach the social foundation without overshooting the planetary boundaries like all nations have done before them? And in emerging economies, similarly, how can we bring back resource use without, while simultaneously reaching the social foundation? And in the highest income countries, of course, how can we radically, radically reduce levels of resource use in a way that doesn't reduce our levels of well-being? So these are big questions. And the, 
one of the core questions building on a previous study that this one that I'm showing here is in answer was, okay, this is a snapshot. It's, it, but it doesn't provide a sense of like where countries are heading, right? So maybe there's a country that's, it's not in the donut, but it's like moving towards it. And that was really the, the overarching question of, of this latest study that I'm showing. And what we found is that the, the image looks like this. Generally, we see that from the early 1990s, we see a, a process of countries almost transgressing biophysical boundaries faster than they improve their levels of social performance. So they move kind of from the, the left to the right along the bottom of the chart before starting to, to achieve a significant, significant number of social, social uh, thresholds. I think it's worthwhile highlighting Costa Rica there in the middle. And it's one country that tends to tends to do the best from a relative perspective. Like compared to other countries, Costa Rica is one of the most effective at transforming levels of resource use into high levels of social well-being. So, so that's good. But at the same time, we do see that same general trend of, of transgressing more and more planetary boundaries as they as they improve levels of social performance. Of course, every nation is different and has its own local context, but I think there is a decent amount to be learned from Costa Rica's experience in terms of their commitment to universal basic services, for one, around health, education. They actually abolished the, the military quite some decades ago, which of course frees up spending uh, for that universal basic provisioning. And as well, they've been one of the few countries through re rewilding policies and addressing, well, they've actually reversed, halted, and you know, turned around their rates of deforestation since the since the 1990s. So uh, interesting, interesting case study, and that shows up in our data and our results. But one of the things that's missing from this image, it's almost if you look at there's almost three main groups of countries. In the bottom left, we have some of the poorest, lowest income countries in the world. In the top right, you have some of the richest high income nations in the world. And in the middle are kind of a mix of emerging and middle income nations. And I think that this, this visualization does show a useful trajectory for some of those nations, but in particular for high income nations, it doesn't really say much because they haven't really moved over the period. They just, it just shows them up there in the top right. But what it doesn't tell us, of course, is what if they've already transgressed nearly all of the boundaries, are they moving back within or are they moving further beyond? What is the extent of their level of overshoot? So we can look at that in a different way. For example, looking at Nigeria, China, and the United States over time, looking at their donut. And you can see that the United States hasn't just been just sitting at one spot in many cases across many indicators their level of environmental pressure the extent of overshoot has continued to to increase over this period as well and again i think this is as many donuts as i could on a chart but if you map that that average extent of ecological overshoot and social shortfall then a very similar picture comes out where we can see that Again, no nation can put up its hand, but we can see some nations like emerging and middle income countries who are almost almost getting pretty close to it. So I have completely stopped using the framing of developed and developing countries based on these results. So I invite you all to catch yourselves if you if you do find yourself referring to lower or middle income countries as developing and as the high income countries of the world as developed because what these results fundamentally show is that we are all developing countries and that we all have, you know, very radical and transformative action is needed. And of course, we can't just say that these nations are living their own little totally separate realities. We know that they are deeply interconnected through history and through power, through a history of colonialism, military power and corporate power existing trade and finance rules which are overwhelmed disproportionately skewed in favor of the most wealthy there's ongoing resource extraction there's the impacts of climate change of course which are being first and hardest by some of the communities and countries who have 
contributed little or nothing at all to the to the crisis. So fundamentally, there's a need to not only transform from within countries, but also the relations between them. But how do we do that? So at Donut Economics Action Lab, we propose two big dynamics that need to transform in order for us to, to, to meet this challenge of the 21st century, to meet the needs of all within the means of the living planet. And the first is that we need to transform our economic system from being degenerative, which you know takes resources, makes them into stuff, uses them for a little while, even often only once, and, and throws them away. Uh, we need to transform that system, that linear model, which is massively destructive and exploitative and extractive to the planet, as well as, as well as the people within production system. And we need to transform it into a far more regenerative economic system, which uses those same resources far more carefully and again and again, and more collectively and more creatively, and particularly that works within and with the cycles of the living world. So we need to transform from degenerative to regenerative economic systems. And what could that look like? So just a few examples at the level of landscapes. So clearly we need to transform from just, you know, clear cutting and just raising entire ecosystems uh, because that's massively degenerative. But we can also do more than the aspiration to, you know, do no harm. Right? We can actually do better than 100% less bad. So what regenerative talks about is it says, how can, we, how can we start to undo the damage that we've caused? How can we be generative? How can we restore landscapes to, to, to their previous you know, level of, of generosity that nature was providing before some of the impacts that have been that our production systems are doing? At the level of manufacturing, for example, of course, once again, we need to move beyond the practice of built-in obsolescence, for example. We need our, our products to last as long as possible, but we can also do more than just recycling, of course, that's important, but we can also get into regenerative manufacturing, which is much more about repair, it's about retrofitting, it's about modular design so that you only have to you know, replace one part when it breaks, and so on. So there's a lot of, of creativity that's available there and that already exists. So I wanted to show just here some examples from the private sector alone. I'm not saying that's the only area of innovation. There's huge areas of policy innovation here, but here are some. So if any of you have heard of the Fairphone, so it's a, they're using, really working on their supply chains, an open modular design that allows you to repair just single spots. There's interface, which is designed its factory. They call it factory as forest. So it's looking at the neighboring forest ecosystem and not saying that a factory will be a forest, but just saying that it can, can aim to design, design a manufacturing process in a way that's inspired and that in the way that's inspired by nature, I guess. Of course, as I mentioned, recycling is important uh, and the body shop has been doing that for decades. But of course, we can start closing those loops of materials as there's a uh, company called Houdini that has very exemplary, it's towards regenerative solutions, not saying any company or any of these products is perfect, but it's towards that type of methodology that I think is needed for the 21st century. So that's one, degenerate, degenerative to regenerative. The other big dynamic is that we need to transform our economic system from being divisive in terms of the opportunity and value that's captured through economic processes, generally in the hands of a few, into a far more distributive system that, that shares that same opportunity and value with all who co-create it. And just to give a taste of, for me, I was shocked to find out that the number of billionaires has doubled in the past decade from you know, just over 1,000 to, to more than 2,000 billionaires today. So just we're living in an age of, of increasing inequality and increasingly divisive economic system. And we really, really need to turn that around. But again, it's there's lots of instances and examples that we can draw upon for what this could look like. So again, clearly divisive poverty wages, uh, they need to need to be abolished. We need to 
make sure that people are are earning a living wage if they're working. But of course, once again, we can do more than just just uh, uh, make sure that people have enough to survive. We can also make it so that employees in these processes not only have a living wage, but they there's other ways to share benefits created by the company in terms of profit sharing and, and lots of innovative business models there. At the level of intellectual property, of course, you know, just having very close protected intellectual property regimes is is something that we need to be move beyond in order to reach, you know, just to address the urgency of the 21st century challenges that we face. And technology partnerships and alliances that aim to unlock and inspire creativity are a good step in that way. But what we really need, I believe, is an open source design that's just radically open so that it's, you know, People can, we, it just harnesses the creativity of our global community who are now connected. Uh, and again, I think that that is one of the few forces that's strong enough to face the challenges that we're, that we're facing this century. Some more examples, once again, small scale, not perfect, but generally, uh, I believe, the steps in the right direction, recognizing supply chains, right? Committing to paying living wages to your suppliers. There's a company called El Puente who's renowned for that. Richard Sounds in the UK has a very uh, innovative employee empowerment program where again, not just living wages, but also deeper involvement in the, in the core design of the, of the business. There's, if any of you have heard or check it out, the Fair BNB, instead of Airbnb, they're actually committing to a, to a community focused tourism where a significant uh, I can't remember the number of the uh, percentage of profits goes towards social enterprise. And as well, those who are on the platform have, have to demonstrate a commitment to community-based values as well. And then there's also the fair tax mark, which an example is the company Lush. And the idea is that, you know, to ensure that corporations and businesses are paying their fair tax in the right place at the right time. And um, there's a cer certification for that. So again, not perfect, but just some illustrations of the types of directions that are needed, I believe. So I have talked about some idea, well, I presented the donut, shown how, what it could look like at a national scale, a little bit on the transformative dynamics that we believe at a very broad abstract level, but then that gets into, okay, but how do we ground these concepts to the places that we live? And that's a question that we've really been seeing a lot of ambition from in cities, maybe because cities are closer to closer to where people live, right? That, and we have been asking this question, so how can our city help bring humanity into the donut? And the idea is that if we unroll it, then we can start to, to almost jump inside the donut and think about what it would look like to, to to live within that safe and just space or how we're moving beyond it on or transgressing or overshooting or falling short. And the core question is this, that we invite all you know, ambitious cities or places so we can do it today with Mannheim in mind. We could say, how could Mannheim become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? So that's, uh, there's a lot in that question, which can be broken down into these four core smaller questions. So the first one, how can all the people of our city thrive? So essentially this recognizes that everyone has kind of universal needs for food and water and education and so on, but the ways in which we satisfy those needs vary enormously across cultures and across time. So this question aims to capture what does it mean for the people of our city to thrive like here? Then we can say, how can our city be as generous as the wild land next door? So that's getting back to what I was saying. How can we take as inspiration the, the ecosystem within which we're embedded? So where on this planet is our city? And how has nature learned over billions of years often to, to thrive in this place? And how can we design our city so that we're storing carbon or cycling water or storing nutrients and so on in a way that is compatible with the climate and the ecological conditions that we're, that we're living in? 
And these two questions are really, they lay out the local aspirations of, of a place, like thriving people in a thriving place. But of course, we need to acknowledge that no place is, is an island, except, I mean, some islands, but even there, they are uh, embedded within a much broader system. And so how can our city respect the health of the whole planet? So here we can think about all of the food or the electronics or the clothing or the materials that are the goods and the services flowing through a city and ask what are the resources and the energy that are embodied within those and the waste that are similar, you know, that are created as a result of producing and consuming them. And what are the impacts on the planetary boundaries through that? And if everybody consumed resources and emitted waste in that way, what would our global climate and biodiversity and other ecological you know, indicators, what would they look like? Then the final one is how can our city respect the well-being of all people? So again, think of those same products, the food, the clothing, the electronics, but instead of thinking of the resources embodied within each of those goods and services, think now of the workers and the communities who created them. So those who grew the food or stitched the clothes or assembled or mined or distributed or uh, you know, delivered them to our doors. What are their living conditions and their working conditions like? And of course, it's not just supply chains. There are other interconnections that our places have with the rest of the world through, through history, through uh, our own lifestyles generate impacts on others through climate change, for example. We have our own, you know, how do we welcome migrants? How do we deal, how do we recognize that we are in a community of, on this planet? So that's what these questions aim out to do, aim to, to bring out. And they're quite complex. We know that it's, it's a lot to take in, but when we speak to city planners and, and practitioners, what we find is that it actually like opens up a space that is big enough so that every person can see like their thing. They can say, hey, I'm in food or I'm in education. And you can see your particular role or your sector, but you see it in the context of a much greater whole. And that's really what the, the objective of this tool is meant to do. Not really providing answers, but asking the types of questions that help help identify entry points that are relevant for particular places without necessarily, you know, someone like me who knows nothing about Mannheim saying, this is what Mannheim should do. No, it's saying, this is what, if you're interested and you're embedded in this place, some questions that we have found useful. And fundamentally there, it's really these four different areas. So the first one, in all of the indicators or metrics that I've shown, the first question is like, what's our target or what's our commitment? And is that ambitious enough? So if it's planetary boundaries or local aspirations, there's a core need to identify the objective. And then of course, say, how are we doing? Is there data that's you know, tracking our performance with respect to this objective or this target? And oftentimes in this tool, we found that the answer is very clearly no, particularly in that global social um, metric that I saw before. It's a, it's a new vision that many cities are, are have not historically been concerned with. You know, you think about how can our people thrive here without so much thinking about the interconnections with others. But of course, another really important part of this tool, I believe, is that it starts allowing us to flag what positive initiatives are already underway in this place and what more can they inspire? So how can we start mapping on or layering on to the, the data-led picture stories of lived experience, stories of initiatives that are, you know, maybe small now, but can grow. And how can we celebrate those? And at the same time, how can we acknowledge, you know, what now based on this picture, what must we do and how do we make it happen? So really it's a tool to inspire transformative action. And that's how we present it. So I feel like I've been blabbering on a lot about this tool, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's exactly the types of questions that need to be confronted in the 21st century, and they don't just go away if we ignore them. So we, we introduced the very first public presentation of the, the city portrait, as it's called, was published in April 2020 by Amsterdam. And this was at the height of the first wave of the COVID pandemic. So actually, there was a 
there is a lot of traction in the media around what Amsterdam was doing when they published this because, you know, it was like a new vision, a new way to build back better. Of course, we all know that after the past couple of years, there's been a, there's, I would argue, we haven't really built back better. Um, but what we have seen is a lot of, a lot of ambition, again, maybe at a smaller scale, from cities and from regions who have picked up this tool. We followed it up with a methodological guide. And since just recently this year, we released a set of five tools that are aimed to, to unleash this concept of unrolling the donut. And today, there's more than 40 municipalities who are actively engaging with the concepts of donut economics in their policies, in their mapping, in their whether it's a data-led or a policy-led perspective, as well as around 30 community-led initiatives that are being led by like self-organizing alliances and coalitions uh, that are embedded in a place, whether it's Brussels or Barcelona or Copenhagen, Ipoh or Thimphu or Amsterdam, of course. And just a few examples and I'll wrap up. So Brussels just started shortly after Amsterdam published their report, they got in touch with Donut Economics Action Lab and said, this is great. This is the vision we're looking for. Can you do it here? To which we replied, no, we can't actually, because we're not in Brussels. Amsterdam was like a proof of concept. And what we would love for you to do is find a local partner who's embedded in your city. And we can, you know, we can have a kind of triangle type of relationship where if they need technical support or if you need support in terms of the narrative then we can help but really we want you to be engaging with people who are locally embedded in the community and they did that and the work is brilliant just recently translated into english actually um, for those of you who are not french speaking then we had leeds which did a similar thing it was led except this time instead of the city leading it was more a community-led initiative that partnered up with the university and just recently launched a report that was you know, that was very galvanizing in terms of the the engagement with community with the community. In Barcelona, they're doing kind of both things. There's participatory engagement at the community level as well as data-led portrait, um, and that work is ongoing. It should be getting published a report based on their results and their engagement in the coming months. In Birmingham, there's an amazing neighborhood-led action through an organization called Civic Square, which is doing really, really innovative spots where if you think cities are an area, then when you get down to a neighborhood, then that's really where you're, where you're seeing just a, a groundedness or embeddedness in a, in a place that I think is very inspiring. And finally, in Germany. So I just quickly threw this slide together uh, to let you all know about a... Uh, a few initiatives that are happening. So one of them is the public consultancy called PD, uh, who is who did a, a quite a extensive report with some interviewing of a lot of different cities as well, both within Germany as well as beyond. And that's available in both German and English now, as well as there's multiple coalitions in Berlin, in Frankfurt, in Hamburg, who are also engaging with the concepts and the tools of donut economics at a, at a community level. So we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to stop speaking now, which you're probably grateful for, but I just wanted to take a step to acknowledge that we've moved far beyond the, the, you know, the economic system as a whole paradigm that I mentioned at the beginning to recognize that the economy is embedded within society, within the earth system. We need to transform from degenerative to regenerative, divisive to distributive, and that there are tools that we can ask deep, important questions in order to start figuring out what that means for our places. So I will leave it there. Uh, beyond saying that you're all invited to check out our website, as well as join the Donut Economics Action Lab community. You can become a member, you can post your own tools or stories or events. And, and I really believe that that's one of the ways that we can inspire others to also take action. So thank you very much. And I will look forward to the discussion. Let me stop sharing.